seems that some folks, at least over at YouTube, were offended and triggered by the demonic skull background, uh, claiming that I have demons all around me and that I'm even beginning to look like Satan himself. Because, you know, for them, Satan is actually a real physical being down in the pit of earth with a pitchfork and torturing people all day and night. Soon to where I am to make my abode for eternity. Uh, but let's get to more important things, shall we? Because our eternity hinges on these stories. Um, an interesting tidbit would be the neighboring scriptures of the most iconic and revered scripture in the Bible, according to most, which would be John 3.16. And it's tied to this passage, number 51, that we'll read today, Snakes on a Desert Plain, out of the Holy Shit of the Bible. And we are in Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9, in the New Living Translation. From Mount Or, they, the Israelites, set out by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent, and live. Yeah. We'll skip the King James Version here. Get into the commentary. This is unequivocally and undisputedly a wildly preposterous gem of a story. Equally outlandish is the lesser-known absurdity of Jesus hearkening back to this passage within the same breath of what is sometimes referred to as the golden text of the Bible. Martin Luther called it the gospel in miniature. Author Max Lucado described it as the hope diamond of the Bible. William Barclay noted, This text has been called everybody's text, and it is easily one of the most recognized and beloved scriptures of the entire Bible. This scripture is, of course, John 3.16. A justifiably common footnote regarding the prior verse, John 3.15, reads, Some interpreters hold that the quotation ends at verse 15. Nevertheless, John 3.14-16 reads, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thus, for this exercise, and an utmost sacrilege, we can eliminate the repetitious verse 16 and further isolate the bizarre adjoining of these verses. A choice defense among adherents is the constant usage of context. Usually, one will try a feeble attempt in bolstering the veracity of a Bible verse or story by profusely using the trendy fallback of, you have to consider the context. Yes, for those that haven't read the Bible in its entirety, nor have read even half of the stories within its pages, and usually abstain from the Old Testament due to the indescribably horrific and immoral nature of God, which many attempt to defend, nor can quote the books and the alleged authorship of the Bible, nor simply cite the Ten Commandments among many other laughable irregularities when considering the gravity one places upon its contents, the context fallback remains a safe haven and a favorite. Putting context to bed... The one word answer is obviously, though only obviously for when it obviously applies. If I were Nicodemus or a nearby disciple listening in on this teaching of Jesus in John 3, I would have enjoyed asking him to expound on the context of his obscure citation in verse 14. Something like, Jesus, since you and the Father are one, to quote only one of many references of Jesus being equal to God, the Son of God, part of the Trinity, pre-existent, etc. You either aided or advocated the acts of what every jot and tittle records in the Old Testament, including the demented snake story you just referenced. Call me stupid, or that of a reprobate mind, or maybe demonically possessed, but why did you send snakes to bite and kill? 
Also, why the idolatrous command to make a magically healing bronze serpent? Sorry, lastly, why are you quoting this insane story? Context, please? Yes, one will attempt to draw parallels between the snake on the pole and Jesus on the cross, inferring symbols of atonement, yet I refuse to accept this convenient narrative to water down this senseless snake story. How entertaining it may be if all Sunday school teachers required a more contextual memory verse drill with the inclusion of this 14th verse of John. Parents would unfortunately have to think twice when their children recite it. Anyway, get out of this stuff and go have a great hump day. Love you guys. See ya.